what you do to counteract your own poisons. And we all have them. Hatred, greed, ignorance, anger. What you do offers and improves the entire, offers to and improves the entire collective. And what you do not only matters for the entire collective, but you are also ensuring your own happiness. The trick is to remain in the now, because the now is where the point of power is. This is where the bodhicitta displays into phenomena. Here, now, this moment, this place. What happened five minutes ago isn't happening now. And as you know, the future is not here yet. Although to some people they can't tell that because they have planned out the future and they have so much tension and angst about the future. The mind is busy, 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 busy. And they don't realize they're thinking about what if, what if, what if, what if. And it's, it's a very neurotic process because the mind is never clear. And when you're doing that, rushing to the future while it's not here, where is your nature? What has happened? Where is the bodhicitta? Where is the point of power? Nothing is happening. You are conceptualizing because you cannot know the future yet. Does that mean that you don't make plans? Well, of course not. Of course not, that's ridiculous. But even within making plans, if the mind is already trained and is continuing to train to be spacious and relaxed, dismiss the future and let the past go and remain in the present moment. Remain in the present. That's your point of power. If you are conceptualizing to the degree, to the degree that you live in the past trying to rewrite it, which people do, in order to make it more pleasing, or if you're stuck in the future, and people do that because they're always planning, always conceptualizing, always running the game, you will never truly have compassion. Because you cannot see what, who, what is right in front of you. Another thing that happens by living in the past or living in the future is that the present is paralyzed. It's ultimately dysfunctional. Impossible to do anything meaningful in the present moment. Impossible to experience even a moment's happiness. Until you center yourself and allow some space to arise in your mind, tamp down or dissipate the reactiveness, leave the past to bury itself, leave the future to occur naturally, and do what you have to do in this present moment because what you do now, believe it or not, and here's the funny part, influences both the past and the future. <laughs> the wisdom that this present moment is the seed of everything. This is where, right here, is where the great bodhicitta displays itself as phenomena. All sentient beings have within them the seed nature of realization. All sentient beings are inherently the Buddha. They are by nature the very mind, the very essence of enlightenment. But that nature is in seed form at this time. They are not engaging in the method to ripen that seed. It's the same thing as going to a seed store. Many of you have planted gardens, I'm sure, at some point or another. Haven't you ever gone to a seed store and bought little packets of seeds? They're flowers, aren't they? In their nature, they're flowers. 
But, I mean, you wouldn't just give your mother a packet of seeds on Mother's Day. <laughs> hey, you know, work out your own salvation. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. You have to put it in a pot. You have to give it soil. You have to give it some fertilizer. You have to give it some water. And you have to put it in the sun. Or let someone else do it. The proper conditions have to be there. So while all motherly sentient beings are in their nature, in their essence, the Buddha, the proper conditions have not been there. You somehow have found yourself in a flower pot. Your responsibility then is to bloom that Buddha nature, to ripen it, to allow it to occur through applying the necessary technology. Patience is really not my strong point in one way. And in another way, that's not true. I'm like a horse pulling, 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 always pulling, you know, really pulling hard, straining to pull hard. It seems like I'm always in that posture. I am accomplishing my goal, and I'm doing the best that I can. And there's a, there's a stability of mind inherent in that kind of posture that is not inherent in the posture that one has if one is simply waiting for the great sound of the end. One can remain in love. One can remain patient and stable in love. We don't hang out in guilt very long because as I've tried to teach many times, that's somebody else's emotion. We don't, we don't specialize in guilt around here. We go for remorse. <laughs> so immediately when you feel guilty, go straight to remorse and hang out there for just a brief time long enough to work it. Remorse is a good thing. It's an eye-opener. It's a self-awareness thing. One can, it's like a directional compass in some ways. If one makes a mistake and feels like no longer grounded, no longer going in the right direction, no longer sure of what's happening inside your brain, Sometimes it's really good to take account, and whether that account comes from your teacher on the outside, or whether it comes from, hopefully, your own inner practice where you can look at your mind and say, hmm, some work to do here. That guilt stays inside like a cancer and is, has a warping effect. It closes doors. It doesn't open any doors. And remorse, on the other hand, is like, um, well, I hate to sound so graphic, but it's a little bit like a bloodletting. You know, to get the old blood out and let the new blood circulate. So maybe we've gathered some worldly things. We have a nice education. We have a nice house. We have a nice car. You know, we have a nice circle of friends. We have, don't you love that? Our neat little circles of friends. And um, we have all those things, and they're all worldly, and we lose them at the end of our lives. We spend so much time engaging, so much time trying to fulfill that uh, temporary part of us that we simply do not understand that there's more to it than that. And so we're like, um, we're kind of like badly dressed Americans playing church. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The path, do you understand that path is a verb? It's a commitment. It's what you do. It's not an object that you flaunt in front of others. It's not a thing that makes you feel holier than somebody else. It's a way of life. And it takes contemplation, self-honesty. There needs to be self-honesty. Number one, self-honesty. How am I practicing? What is my motivation? What's really going on here? A friend of mine recently said sometimes it's, it behooves us to step back and say, what is this and what am I? Just so we don't get lost in the jar, like, crazy, like the crazy bees we are. So you must find a way to drain that moat, put down the bridge, let Dharma come into you. Let it come deep. Don't change your actions. Change your heart. Change your mind. Don't just change on the outside. Let it take you over. 
you think that you're being protective about yourself, you see, because this is me, and I don't, I don't like to change, I don't like to give it over. You know, you think you're being protective, but you don't even know what you are. But now's the time to be strong. And this is the time when we can really commit to being an active Dharma presence in the world. The thing that I have come to understand is that this is no time for any of us to hang out in our comfort zone. I think in this time, we've got to give it all we've got. This is it. Everything in samsara is falling apart, and it's time to be what you can be. I feel that uh, we all should take a posture of like Dharma warriors. Not a warrior to harm anyone, but a warrior for the path. A warrior that, warrior that cares for the path, that guards the path. So we prefer to sit on our cushions and say, to do, to do, to do, I'm doing my practice, and I look stunning doing it. You know, but really, we should also be active. We should be not only engaging in the extraordinary kindness of practice, but also the ordinary human kindness of everyday caring for those around us, caring for the world at large, caring for beings that are suffering, animals, people, whatever, anything that lives, doing all that we can to actively end suffering. To engage in that kind of practice in this world today is very, very powerful. And so where will the Dharma be safe? <coughs> I know where, right here, right there. That's where the Dharma is going to be safe. And so I presented the iPod saying, this is the beginning of an entire library of Buddhist music for Americans to listen to that will bring them to Dharma and that will help them to hear mantra. And actually, during one of the talks that I had with His Holiness, he said, you must continue this. He said, every time someone hears mantra, even if it's only once, even if it's just a little bit, they have some connection for the future. And all of us have the inherent Buddha nature, but there are many sentient beings, large and small, human and non-human, that don't have the proper connections yet. And so even if you broadcast the music and it's, hear, and it's heard by worms and bugs, they're hearing mantra. They don't know it, but the connection is made. He said this is really important work in a time where there are less and less real practitioners. Uh, this is good work. This is what he said. I, he said, please continue. <laughs> Oh.
Awaken. 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 Awaken.